Hi everyone, I am Prerna Kaldra, founder and CEO of Dalcini. Investors across the world have invested billions of dollars into hyperlocal startups like Zepto and Dunzo that promise to deliver the product of your choice within 10 to 30 minutes. In this episode of the Founder Thesis podcast, your host Akshay Dath is talking with Prerna Kalra, the founder of Dalchini, which is building a platform to deliver food products to you within 60 seconds. Dalchini has built an amazingly asset light platform of vending machines offering fresh, hygienic, healthy food within seconds. Their unique model allows micro entrepreneurs to set up these vending machines and start earning revenue within months. And on the other hand, they are a formidable distribution channel for cloud kitchens and D2C food and beverage brands. In this conversation, Prerna shares her journey of finding the right business model and how they scale to about 1,000 vending machines today. Listen on, and if you like such thrilling conversations about discovering product market fit, then do subscribe to the Founder Thesis podcast on any audio streaming app. I was born in Meerut, which is a city in Uttar Pradesh, uh, about 70 kilometers from Delhi. Then my parents run a mom and pop store. They still do Kirana store. And that actually was my inspiration to do retail tech startup. So career-wise, I was the first engineer out of my entire family and the first, I would say, person to go out and study because I had interest in math science. So started preparing for IITs and IIMs, etc. but landed into Punjab University, did my engineering from there in electronics and communication. And you didn't sit for placements after your engineering? Uh, I got through Infosys, but then I wanted to do MBA after that. So I had applied for CAT also. And I had got about 98.7 percentile in CAD. So that again gave me a reason that, okay, I should do MBA first. You chose IMT Ghazibad because of like proximity to merit. So then what, like from uh, uh, campus, did you, where did you set for placements? Yeah, yeah, from campus itself, I got into Fino Payments Bank. So my entry into FinTech happened because of that. But prior to that happened... Dalcini, it's in previous version, which was Clinic Foods, right, at that point in time. So I did start up during my college time itself. And in fact... So college meaning IMT or Punjab University? IMT. IMT. And Clinic Food was basically a distribution of healthy food items. And it was 2009, Levin Brother crash. And hence, my entire ambition... To start a crash because everybody was like looking for a stable job and startup culture, etc. was there in 2009, but still it was just coming up. And uh, I would say that I did not have that much guts at that point in time, probably did not have money, right, to start up, took a safer option and sat for placement. And though I had in, a, in one of the B-plan competition, I won 50,000 for starting up. In fact, Clinic Foods. But then also we did launch it. What was your distribution plan for that? Like, how would you distribute? Was it like through retail outlets? You would like a D2C, build your own brand? Yeah, if you today uh, talk about D2C, everybody knows. But 2009, it was not known. And we had plans to do a D2C model of distributing fresh food fresh baked items, both Indianized version, which is basically chapatis distribution. And uh, that was the idea. Like people can do a monthly subscription and get fresh chapatis at their home. At home, delivered. Okay. And it's not like a frozen chapati or it's fresh chapati. Like you get fresh bread, which is like three to seven days shelf life. Similarly, fresh chapatis you would get delivered. And different versions of chapatis from methi parathas to kind of things, right? that you would get delivered at home and then you can do a subscription on it and uh, take more items on it. So that was the idea, initial idea. We did try it out in college with few of our professors and all of but then did not materialize it beyond college campus. Okay, got it. Interesting. Okay. So what were you doing at Fino? 
So Fino, I was. Uh, Tell me a bit about Fino. Also, what what is Fino? What does what do they do? So Fino is basically into financial inclusion. So it's basically a fintech company which is more into last mile financial product distribution for banks and NBFCs, but primarily into rural areas. So it would be like beyond tier two, tier three cities. All of these RSBYs, etc. Rashtriya Swasth Bima Yojana. So they would distribute insurance, Marega payment, basically all that labor payments that you that the government distributes so for that Aadhaar linked payment distribution etc they had set up there would be block coordinators and district coordinators who would distribute insurance to loans to savings accounts to their government payments everything to that mobile handheld device and because I was placed there as a management trainee my job was to learn how that distribution work because eventually I was then moved to the product team over there who was developing product for rural fintech space. And that's where I met founder of Paytm in one of the conferences and he discussed the idea and then I came for an interview. This was when Paytm was known as a recharge your mobile phone kind of a service. Yeah, yeah, 2011. They didn't have a wallet yet. Yeah, they did not have a wallet. So 2011, it was just a mobile recharge website, not... In fact, not even an app, even app was not there. And 2011, they were just starting up. They had applied for license of Paytm wallet to RBI. And that's the time I joined Paytm. So I was among the first three people out there. Probably the first one from the fintech space to join this. I was started as a product manager over there and then ended up as the product manager. For about eight years, I was heading the payments product at Paytm. Okay, okay. Including Paytm Wallet and Paytm Bank. The core Paytm app app was your baby, basically. Yeah, so all that scan and pay that you see, that part. So there are a bunch of features in Paytm app from mobile recharge to marketplace, etc. Not that, the payment portion. Wallet, scan and pay, payment gateway. And then the Paytm Payments Bank was my last product that I and launched to buy at Paytm. So you executed that Uber partnership? Yeah, Uber partnership, primarily from the product standpoint. That was also an interesting time period because RBI asked Uber to comply to their guidelines and Paytm gave this as a solution to them that how they can comply to RBI guidelines. That frictionless, like as soon as your ride is done, you just walk out. Yeah, yeah. Were you there during demonetization? Yeah. I would say that at least for 15 days, me and my entire team were in office for more than 18 hours, right, in office. And we were churning out products like nothing. Every day we were doing a release, which was like the most important release of the day. And everybody has to be there in office for doing it. And yeah, Give me examples of what kind of products were needed. How you can sign up for QR code based payment in one day. So it was... For most of the products were for the merchant side because consumer penetration of Paytm was there. Even prior de- pre demonetization, it was there. But what was not there? Merchant acceptance. And the consumer product was also mature. It was like. The consumer product was mature, but merchant side acceptance was not there in the offline space. And uh, were you there when UPI was launched? And- yeah, so my last product at Paytm was Paytm Payments Bank only. And the UPI was part of the first release of Paytm Payments Bank. In fact, Paytm was delayed in launching UPI primarily because of. Paytm Payments Bank, like Paytm Payments Bank had to go and then only UPI had to go because if you see all other payments app, for example, Google Pay or they have their handles at, it has a handle of at Paytm, but for that Paytm handle, it had to become Paytm Payments Bank first and then get that handle. I was under the impression that Paytm was like going slow on UPI adoption because it would hit the wallet business. Because in the wallet business, there's a 2% that they would write when the merchant withdraws the money. Which... And that's what people say. That's what people say. Which in, in UPI, then that that merchant discount rate is zero. No, that, that's what people say. But they had to launch uh, the payment bank. Otherwise, they would have also ended up creating handles in the bank's name, in some other bank's name. And it's difficult to acquire customers again and again, I think. Okay, okay, okay. 
to me, it looks like this. That's the key strategy, at least at that point in time. Okay. Okay. So then what? What made you leave Paytm? In 2017, right? After the launch of Paytm's payment bank, that's when I decided, okay, I'm done with fintech. I have done a lot of it. I actually wanted to do something in the retail tech space. So payments is you're building a platform for micro transactions. That's what you're doing. And I wanted to do something similar for the retail space. How do you digitize the micro ordering, which happens at every retail outlet? How can you bring technology over there and I've seen the pain you stand at the store from morning 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. the night and you hog a lot for just for the walk-in customers right but there's a lot of scope over there that you can digitize a lot of those transactions and make like simpler for those retailers so that was the idea and I had this clinic food thing in my brain that I have to create a distribution for fresh healthy food. All of these things were going out in my mind and I wanted to do some trials. I asked uh, Vijay that I want to do some trials and I'm leaving. So he asked me that while you're working here, you come once or twice a week. You start with your idea, right? I started with two vending machines, one in Paytm office and one in 91 Springboard, which is a co-working space with two vending machines. In uh, no- Noida only. In Noida only. Primarily dispensing breads, different kinds of breads. Methi parathas, plain paratha, ajwaini parathas and sandwiches, wraps, rolls. Fresh food basically being dispensed through vending machines. So you can like instantly without waiting 40 minutes and without spending 40 rupees of your delivery time and cost. You can get instant healthy food. This would like this would remain warm inside the machine or you would heat it in a microwave after you buy it? Yeah, so this would remain cold like you keep your food in fridge and it remains fresh so like that. So it would remain fresh inside the vending machine and when you take it out there is a microwave attached to it there's a vent attached to it you just microwave it and consume it. Right? That was what I was trying. Prior to that when I was there in Paytm I had gone to China a number of times and I had seen this happening there. It was new in India but not otherwise. Like in China you saw what fresh food available or was it like Momo's being dispensed through vending machines. That was something that I saw there. And I was like, my basically memory of vending machines is at airport dispensing cold ring water and chips. Perfect. That's it. And it was so different. They were dispensing boiled eggs, momos, fruit boxes, everything from vending machine versus in India, only those packaged food. And so actually, I would say that I did not come up with Dalchini as an idea on day one. I had these dots that I want to do fresh food distribution. I want to do last while there has to be a retail element to it because I want to make it instant for the customer. I don't want people to be there and a lot of operational element over there. So I wanted to some kind of automated. You want to use tech uh, to remove friction. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, because I do not want like people like my father, right, to be sitting there all day on those retail stores. So while I had to be near the customers, but did not want people to be managing those stores all the time, rather being more efficient when it comes to people resources. So these dots were there. I was just trying to connect if can vending machines or can a smart store so what we have at Dalchini is actually not a vending machine. We call it as Dalchini because it's not really a vending machine. It's a much smarter version of it because it manages time. It manages temperature. It manages a lot of things about the about that smart store. It also understands what the consumer wants based on data. So it would project that, okay, this office people mostly consume methi parathas at say 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. So they would accordingly customize the menu for this kind of location and then bundle it with the supply chain and give the information to the people who manage say sector two right that is what our idea of smart retail was that it has to be link this entire supply chain so that we are able to deliver both perishable and normal perishable items in the equally efficient manner tell me the journey from 91 springboard and ptm you had your test machines these test machines you imported from china so I went to Coimbatore for three days, got it developed over there, like sitting there with a few engineers, the time spent there and then 
got it done over there. There are companies which make this in India. I guess this would be like a refrigerator plus plus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then I had a vacant flat in Noida. So got a bunch of engineers whom I knew from my Paytm times. I had left Paytm some time back. So I got them in that vacant flat and we all sat there and designed this. When we got it contract manufactured in Coimbra to got those uh, two machines to Noida and installed it, right? And it had a QR code based payment, like you could scan and pay. There was no buttons on this vending machine, so. Ah, okay. There was a display. It was not really like the vending machine you would have seen at airport, etc. It was all, it was just a touch screen or there is a QR code you scan and you experience it on your own mobile phone. Okay, okay, okay. You can like download the app and then order through the app. Yeah. Yeah, you can download the app or you can just scan and sit back and just browse what is available and then block your items from the vending machine and pick it up instantly from there. So that was the kind of experience we wanted to give because I had seen that home delivery apps, etc., Zomato and Swiggy, etc., they were doing good. People were getting habitual of ordering while sitting on their desk. That was my objective that, okay, I... I'm creating a physical distribution, but it has to be... Hyper-local Zomato. Yeah, digital element to it. So it has to be physical plus digital, both put together. It would become difficult, but it would it should be able to give that experience to the customers. So from these two machines, then tell me the journey. So in fact, during these two journeys, you met a lot of Cloud Kitchen guys. How do you prepare food for vending machines? I come from fintech background i understand tech i was passionate about retail tech but food oh god so in fact he caught one person who was working in the same co-working space as a restaurant manager of their canteen we said that come sit with us explain us food so then we got onboarded somebody who had 10 years of experience working with pizza hut and mcdonald's and we asked them to explain us that how food works so that we can relate to how food in vending machine can, would work. Marriage between the two. Because food had to be modified in a way so that it can stay good in the vending machine. And yet, it had to be preservative-less, etc. Because that was the core objective, providing fresh food. Right? Did a lot of brainstorming work around that. So it took us six months to create a perfect product. When I say product in the vending machine, so a lot of work going on. How to perfect that hardware aspect of it. The hardware, the app, and the food. Like these would be the three elements. Like the the yeah order experience, the point of sale hardware, and the supply chain for the food. Supply chain for the food. April to 2018, we actually started then ramping this up with from two to five to ten to like. Yeah. What What made you confident that you have found product market fit? Like, what was each machine doing in terms of revenue? So we were doing about fifty sixty thousand a month, which is about two thousand rupees worth of sale per day from each vending machine that was yeah that was good number we had achieved you had to pay rent to the facility owner or this was a value add so they were not charging you this was a value add this was a value add service because obviously people in both co-working space and at PTM they used to stay long as uh, they had long working hours and we could see that from data also right there were peaks in date in sales during that time period after six seven when the canteen of this cafeteria etc all is closed you would see a peak right over there you would see a peak in the morning breakfast and that's what told us that okay we need to have some timelines for refilling the vending machine because our customers come to us at 9 a.m right in the morning data gave us a lot of insights around what is what when how where the customer is asking for and we kept correcting on that aspect, we kept on working on both, on all these three elements, like the user experience on the app side, the hardware and the product being sourced and refilled the vending machine. The vending machine was like IoT enabled, so it would give you back data of each unit being sold and so on and so forth. Like what all were you getting data from the machine? Yeah, so they were like about 23 elements captured through all the vending machines, which which was helping the supply chain chain to get perfected. Apart from that, even on the vending machine side, we were able to control the temperature, music, light, the shelf life of the product. All of that experience around the vending machine was something that we were able to control 
remotely and that actually became our backbone because a traditional vending machine you would not have that kind of a control and hence perishable food was not possible so in fact uh, i would say on the fresh food side that we started capturing a lot of insight from the customers also that we started showing them menu and start starting asking them what would you like to buy right from the in fact i would say that a lot of customer insights was captured by that intern of ours who was on the customer support side with whom we would sit end of the week and gather all the inputs that you would have got for the entire week so that on the weekend the tech team can work on those aspects so each machine doing 2000 a day so what is the break even period like because you would pay upfront to buy a machine so what is the payback period for that a, a vending machine which is doing this kind of a sale would pay back in about 8 10 months on the initial cost say it's it costs about a lakh plus so it would pay off and in fact during that time we discovered how do you really scale in a environment like this where it's Mostly, if you look at startups of today, they are asset yeah. light. You have to buy the asset. Yeah, so we had to buy the asset. Obviously, that's that problem solving came on little later. But the first year we spent was basically perfecting these three element, which is the user experience, the hardware experience, and the product being sold through the vending machine. Right? That was the basic task. How did you acquire more locations? Was it like through company tie-ups or? like co-working types or what yeah mostly in fact our largest client in the first year itself was eny and how did we do that that was also a very interesting story so we like i and one of my early teammates we approached eny we said that we have this vending machine which can actually serve fresh food and we had eny team members in paytm also who had experience but obviously through them we connected but that never gave us a put in the door what gave us put in the door was we said that we want to give this vending machine for free for one month as a demo to you you just experience if you liked it then you take it for all your offices and in one month time period we got a contract give it for free means what like you will not charge anything to the employees they can just order no we would not charge the company for putting up this vending machine we would just put it up oh okay in your business model the there were two revenue sources one is on sale of product and second is you would charge the company also something so, yeah as a subscription to the company we would charge something as a subscription fee for taking up the service so i want to understand this decision a bit better why not just through sale of product oh uh, okay so this is like an added revenue source that you are adding when you are going into corporates you are only serving corporates employees it's not a vending machine for public but when you're setting it up in say a maybe a hospital maybe in a mall or maybe in a market that's not where you are charging them any subscription fee that's where it is it is something that you are paying it off and obviously when you are just giving that as a service to the employees or the members of that corporate so hence we had put up a subscription fee for the corporates because it was a premium service probably the the price would be different say the price for a mall might be slightly higher than the price in, inside a corporate yeah pricing for the corporates etc obviously we wanted to make it very affordable because it's an everyday food for their employees if you today also look at right how corporates work they do subsidize food for their employees yeah so this was another subsidy only in a way like by paying you a subscription you would be able to sell the products at a slightly lower price Yeah, and like it's basically providing fresh food, healthy food for their employees every day. So it's a premium service because unlike a traditional vending machine, which would only serve packaged food, right? Here they were even getting fruit boxes in the vending machine. They were getting fresh juices, fruits, all through one machine. Which is it's like a six square foot area serving. maybe three tuck shops would have served so that basically acted in our i would say advantage for us and we were able to charge the corporates but before doing that like i mentioned that we gave it as a demo to paytm to eny and asked them that if they can put this up right and just for a demo and they really liked it and then they extended the order for about 10 machines and then it was not going back because we kept on adding in more and more of their offices as we start growing but a lot of our early clients right came with that as a model we entered into snap deal we entered into meetio a lot of these clientels came with that as a model first month free and then 
first month free and then the subscription would start. If you don't like the service, you would take it back after 45 days. And how much is the amount you charge for subscription? So it's 150 rupees per day, which is very normal. It's nothing. So as a corporate also, they like it. And what is your margin on sale of product? If you're selling worth 2000 every day, how much do you earn from that? About 30 odd percent because fresh food has better margins and we has very low operational mm-hmm. cost per se. So we had started making like in 45 days time period, our vending machine would break even on the operational level. And the pay bo- payback would be about eight to 10 months. Your product was like your Noida flat became a kitchen for making the product or like how did you make the product? That was our garage for making vending machines, assembling vending machines. And before we actually moved into a proper space for doing it. For food, we actually had tie- we tied up with you cloud kitchens in and around NCR. And cloud kitchen concept was also moving equally in that time period. A lot of them like customized food for in- including Jubilee and food. They also came on board. They customized few of the products like rice combos, etc., which would fit in well into the vending machine. So supplying some items. Jubilant runs cloud kitchens in addition to the Domino's franchisee or like within the Domino's itself? Jubilant Food, which is a parent company. So they have Jubilant Food Works. They have this division which makes pre good food as well, which includes dal chawal, rajma chawal, primarily they supply to corporates, but they customize the product for our vending machine. And that also became a hit, which gives us confidence that you can not only sell breads, paratas, sandwiches, etc., but you can actually also sell rajma chawal from the vending machine. So from vada pav to rajma chawal, everything is sellable from the vending machine. And for the customer, it is instantly available. Okay, amazing. So yeah, let's talk about that growth journey. So you hit 50 and this was mostly with corporates. Uh, you were telling me like EY, Snapdeal. Yeah, mostly through our connects, through corporates, we were able to, we were still bootstrapped for this entire time period. I sold some of my ESOPs or stocks that I had with Paytm and was working on building this as a model in itself. But what, where they hit road was that, okay, beyond 50, okay, when we have to invest into the hardware, how would we do that? Okay, business model per se from the consumer side is there you have achieved product market you know on an individual unit you are making money but how would you grow that to when you say that you want to be at every 200 meters of habitable area right? which means lacks and lacks of vending machines how would you do that and that's where we started building on a franchising model whereby people or like uh, micro entrepreneurs would come in and would take this as a franchisee and would do it in their own area. So in fact, my first franchisee partner was a female entrepreneur, right? Who came, who joined us and started with four vending machine. And that gives us a confidence that if we keep adding such people who would have their own geographies, their own cohorts in which they would build their own set of vending machines, your asset cost suddenly from the entire platform has gone away. And that's where where our first pivot, or I would say our first change in the model happened. That instead of being a vending machine player, we wanted to become, we started becoming a vending machine platform. I would say instead of becoming a Meru, we started becoming more like an Ola or Uber, where we started enabling others to start a Dalcini business, start a Dalcini franchisee, right? Our start a fresh food vending machine in their own selected geographies. And we became an enabler in providing them supply chain support, technology support, vendor support, whatever was required for running this business, we started giving them. I want to just zoom in on this a little more on the franchisee model. So say a franchisee would pay five lakhs, get four machines in that and some territory defined for them. And then who would do fulfillment like the the stock up? So we would have distributors of fulfillment agents in each geography defined. Who would do, who would help them do the distribution part? And the franchisee would directly pay the distribution agent. And, and yeah, so also the cloud kitchen that was like, Directly between the franchisee. It was not being routed through you, but you were just... No, no, it was, we created a partner app for it, where we connected three partners that we had, the franchisee, the vendor, and the, we call them distribution force, the delivery boy, so to say. We connected all three of them through our partner app. So that was the product that came in year two. We did not have that in year one. 
But when we started working around the maths of scaling this model, so that's where we created this. And this also helped us onboard a lot of brands in our journey who wanted to sell, a lot of cloud kitchens who wanted to sell on our platform. But on the franchisee side, they were not connected to them. How would a franchise that I have to procure food from X? So that's that was the platform we barely connected both of them. It also ensured quality food because it was selected vendors supplying select set of items to the franchisee and being the distribution force also on the same platform. So we were able to measure their SLAs also if, if they're meeting those SLAs or not of refilling on time, refilling on a set frequency, also creating SOPs on what kind of location to be served or refilled at what time period based on sales, etc. Yeah. That's it. So th these SOPs were for the franchisee owner. The franchisee owner would essentially operate this business and take those decisions like deciding what he was like, whether he was to sell Rajma Chawal or Vada Pao. That decision he would take. Yeah, that's what ha started happening. And that that actually became a kind of a problem for us because if franchisee would decide the consumer elements would get lost. The consumer would need X, but the franchisee would want to sell Y because of his or her margins. So that's where we brought in a product called OFT. We call it as OFT, Order for Tomorrow. It's an AI-based tool. It captures the input of that location, various parameters and generates menu and with quantity. This much should be refilled in this vending machine, which comes to the franchisee partner through our partner app. And that is what is taken then as an input in deciding what is to be refilled into the vending machine. Obviously, in the earlier phase of our business, we actually had hit roadblocks because of this element being missing. But then over a period of time, we reiterated. Uh, like, how did you realize that that this is a problem, that franchisee owners are ordering whatever they want and customer is not happy with their selection? So I would say that there is like in this entire like five year, almost five year journey that uh, of Dalcini, there was one very key element that we all always as the core team stand by, which was what is customer saying? What is that the customer actually wants? And we kept our customer support team from the day one itself. Like, in fact, our first intern was hired just for customer support because we actually wanted to get those insights on every week level. That gave us the insight. The partner was refilling X while the customer wanted Y. And he quickly went back to the boardroom and to decide, to brainstorm, how do you control this element? And the entire uh, idea of building OFT actually came through the customer inside soon. So after that, we started creating menus which were pre-published to the consumers and consumers can actually show their intent of what they want to buy, what they don't want to buy, etc. And obviously, data played a big role in deciding wow. uh, on what should be placed as part of the menu in each location. Essentially, franchisees unlocked location intelligence. Like a franchisee would know that, okay, in let's say Greater Noida, these are the places where we can place vending machines and they would probably have some network and through their network, they would also get the doors opened, start the conversation and your team would support in that conversion. So it gave you that yeah. opening of doors and location intelligence in addition to money, of course, that they were investing in buying the hardware. Yeah. yeah. So basically, I would say that when the partner came in, some bought location and investment both, some only came with investment some brought in location and their own like some of them were distributor of fmcg companies they came in as franchisee partners but they did not have investment so we connected them to nbfcs through our platform to get that asset financing loan to fund the asset so the idea was to like if you have to create this network you have to have people who would be equally passionate about this network creating this network as you are as a company how much can a company itself create it has to have partners who are also equally passionate about it and also creating and growing it with the same intent with the same energy and whatever the partner needed the idea was as a platform we shouldn't be able to provide them that what is the expectation from a partner does in addition to that one-time investment does he need to go visit locations do any such thing or is it all on the app? As a model, we created master franchisees and the entire ecosystem, right? 
in which basically enables the partner on the ground to cover for the things that they don't have. They, if they don't have location, they just have investment and the distribution service, he would help them in scouting for locations. So we have third party tires, we have. So distribution doesn't have to be through the app. Like you said, you have the distribution force available on the app. So that is not necessary. Someone can send their own boy to pick up from a cloud kitchen and stock it in the machine. Yeah, but that also is routed through app only. They all have to get onboarded onto the app itself because the vending machines and everything, all Dalcini stores, are they all are controlled through the app itself. It all gets connected to one single cloud where you are managing supply chain and the smart stores both. For logistics, when you are providing logistics support, do you use some third party, say Shadowfax or one of those types? Or Yeah, yeah. So we do have like entire fleet of people who would do distribution because earlier we were dependent on some of these TPS, but now we have our own fleet of people who are managing field. In fact, in most of the metro cities, we would have a dedicated like partner who would have the entire fleet on their payroll, I would say, and would manage it for us. Okay. And you have some sort of a onboarding journey for the distributor, for the distribution field boy so that he can learn how to open the machine and in fact like in in our entire journey we came across a lot of such people who joined us as a distribution force and now on managing two three cities that become city managers so training became an essential component when we onboarded a particular partner with us because it was unlike just amazon swiggy the matter of delivery, where you just have to pick up from point and deliver to point. It was also operating that smart store, refilling that smart store. So it was little more than just point to point in the delivery. And hence, training became very important. We actually ran crash courses in every city that we would go for our partners, for the franchisee, for the distributor. We would run crash courses to onboard them, to train them, and then to, then to do repeat trainings every month once. So that became an essential part of, I would say, our journey. In fact, when we launched one of the largest deployment that we did was in Reliance, Jamnagar, maybe it's a 20,000 acre plant of Reliance and it is the world's largest refinery. And we got a contract to put up about 90 vending machines, 90 smart stores over there. And we had just 45 days time period. And it was peak of COVID-2, wave 2, April 2021. The entire team which was trained over in NCR went there, a 13-member team, and had actually launched the entire 90 vending machines in just 45 days time period. So onboarding training, like you asked, right, became a very essential component of this journey. And you pay, or rather the franchisee pays the distribution person on a per... On a permission basis, yeah. For every run that they do, they get paid a certain amount. Yes. Every refilling that they do and every extra refilling they get, obviously, beyond the minimum, they get commissions and incentives. So what do you earn from a franchisee? What is your relationship? So ours is like a, like, we have a subscription with the client, which is the location owner. Similarly, we have a subscription with the franchisee partner. Okay, that 150 rupees a day, that... Which is basically with the corporate, but there is a one which we run with the franchisee partner, which is a percentage of sales and a fixed component that we earn from them. The idea over there is basically because as the sales grow, as their business grows, so Dalcini also starts. So it's, a, it's lower in the initial period where the sales are lesser, but beyond a mark, then it starts increasing. Got it. What is that number? Like how, what percentage they share with you? So about 3 to 5% of the sales is something that they share with us. Okay. So like a large part of the margin is with them only because you said 30% margin. So 25% of that is them and 5% is going to you. Plus some fixed daily amount. Yeah. So basically a large component goes to the franchisee partner because that's what the idea is that we want to create such ecosystem players who are basically... It's a company in itself and is able to grow in that territory and create that impact in that. You said you now have master franchisee, franchisee, like different levels. How, how does that work? So basically, they would be partners who would have only five to 10 vending machines. So they would be franchisee partners, but then there would be partners who would managing 50 plus, 50 or more. So they would have a larger territory and they might have small, some smaller franchisees under them. So 
a franchisee would be also I running a PG and I have say two three PGs or and I'm running them and I want to put up a vending machine in all of them. But I don't intend to become a Dalchini franchisee partner on an overall basis or for a territory, right? So in that case, we connect them to a master franchisee who would then help them with logistic work, all the supply chain support they would need, any technical support, maintenance support, etc. So in a way, it's almost like FMCG supply chain where you have distributors and retailers. So something similar here. And like when a customer pays, there's only digital payment. You don't have any cash option. Yeah, our vending machines are 100% cashless vending machines, yeah. And that cash will first hit your account and then you will further deduct your take from it and send it to the franchisee. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's the escrow. And uh, like, obviously, this also helps in getting our franchisee partner loans or asset financing from the NBFCs also because the money first, first hits that account. It also gives that, I would say, comfort to the financing partners and helps help them grow also because if the partner needs financing for the asset, that also has to be looked into from the model itself. Okay, so there could be an arrangement where the fintech partner, which is giving the loan, can do like a daily deduction. Yeah, we call it as EDI. We actually launched that during COVID times. A lot of our franchisee partners who wanted to scale, but did not want to invest up front. So we created a model in which there were NBFC who were financing the assets and they were making daily deductions and then the franchisee was getting the rest of the amount on a daily basis. When you create a platform, the problem statement per se like converges to one, which is you want to serve the customer instant anytime, anywhere food. That is just the problem statement from the consumer angle. But if you look at down south, there are a lot of other equally important aspects which will not scale if you don't solve those key problems for the partners that you have in hand. So this financing was one, like there was another one where basically a lot of brands who wanted to sell on our platform, but were not really known to the consumers, how they were given better margins, but the franchisee partner was like, they don't sell, what do I do, etc. right? So that the right mix of product assortment which gives you the right balance of margins and yet you don't lose on to the sales. So that also became a key element of our entire picture. And we created a product for a lot of D2C brands to sell on our platform by advertising and listing their products and pass on that advertising and listing to the franchisee partner to give them a comfort to basically like whatever revenue loss that they get because maybe the product gets lesser sold than as comparison to a regular FMCG brand. On the other side, giving that option to the consumer because unless they try it out, how would they know whether the product is good or not? It's just like when you say like an FMCG company wants to launch new product through their GTs and general trades and modern trade, they had their entire GTM plan. So it was equal to that when you're launching and creating this for about 600 odd stores. The good part was that data played in our favor because we had a lot of data in sight before doing this, right? By that time, we had already built into our analytics platform, which gives us insight that, okay, this price point product, a 50 rupee bar, you might not want to launch it in, say, a manufacturing plant where the AOV is about 28, 29. You would not want to launch it over there, right? AOV means average order value. Yeah, average order value. Yeah, so that data insight helped us capture onto this wave of D2C brands, which was going on and helped them launch. In fact, during this journey, a lot of brand launched their single brand stores with Dalcini as the core platform. Yeah. And they launched their entire smart stores on our platform, which was, which would say, powered by the Alshini app and they would have only their own products also stuck into the smart store. So this would be like in a shopping area, like a mall or something where... Yeah, a metro station or a mall where the brand would want to launch their product and we would help them plan their entire GTM, right, for it. But part is that the brand in this F&B segment, they like this model because their operational costs are very lower. They also saw the value in launching their products on our platform because we were right there where their actual TG is in offices, in hospitals, in colleges. And they all wanted to reach out this they, this customer segment because beyond digital e-commerce penetration that they got through Amazon, Flipkart, Swiggy, Zomato, etc. What next? 
how do they get new customers how do they get customers to taste their product because if you buy on amazon flipkart etc you only can buy their entire batch of say 6 bars or 12 bars unlike that on our platform they could actually try it out just a one bar also the customer could buy and maybe they could run an offer on single bar or maybe buy two get one free something like that on our platform and get that customers insights through our app itself so we call it as precise sampling when a brand wants to launch their product in a for a particular tg say they only want to launch it in colleges or educational institutes coaching institutes etc so say this like this is a tg right in this do you earn from the brand say snickers wanted to launch that kesar pista yeah definitely in this case like one the brand would give you a platform fees second they would what to run some offers so that they would like say run an offer for franchisees that you can buy this at a discount so that their margin is better they could do that and third they could also run an offer for end consumer where like the end consumer when they open the app to order they could be like a deals and they could be like get 5 rupees off on stickers yeah yeah so we would cross sell up sell the customers while they are ordering on the app we would obviously repeat purchases can be incentivized for a particular brand for their one product or for their bunch of products all of this is like both physical and digital elements all club together so when the customer is right there in front of the smart store he's standing there is looking gazing at it and trying to browse what is available if at that point in time you give them an offer hey you buying this would you want to add a bar to it or would you want to are you buying a vada pav would you want to add a juice to it there is a so and so offer running on it that in and because see a lot of this food purchases and like we all know data that a lot of this retail still happens offline still more than 80% percent while we have e-commerce growing etc the impulse purchases still today in india are happening offline and all of this entire segment of fnb purchases of food products right this is all impulse yeah yeah, yeah. I, i would not really order a unknown brand online an unknown brand maybe i see in a store i might still buy it especially food but it's unlikely that i would see an unknown brand online and order it that's true Correct, correct. And you would want to buy a small portion of it, which can be distributed only some through a distribution which is like this or GTMT, general trade, Kiana stores, like the kinds that my parents run. How much do you earn from brands? What percentage of your top line comes from this marketing support to brands? Uh, about ten to fifteen percent, as on date, is already coming from. Do you see that becoming more significant or? See, today we have only bunch of brands who have single brand stores. I see over a period of time when the penetration of smart stores, vending machines, etc., has grown, more and more brands would come up who would want to launch their single brand stores. So that is one major reason that I see that this would become big, right, over a period of time. Within this earning from brand, how much comes from single brand store where the brand is paying you a flat subscription, and how much comes from the go to market where you are promoting the brand? So I would say majorly is. go to market one whereby basically through our own franchises of 800 smart stores most of the brands are selling through that most of it is still that there are very lesser brands who are doing single brand stores but that is something that i'm see- seeing that there are a lot of brands who are showing now interest and would wa- are like liking to so they initially they started with one slot now they want a tray that at least give me three three slots or six slots or a tray so that more of my flavors or more of my products are there on the shelf that is that trend is something that we have already we are already seeing and hence i think that would be that would become significant over a period of time you can't really promise them a whole tray right because if a franchisee doesn't want to display that or doesn't want to order that product or there is enough incentive for the franchisee also in this Oh, yeah, so there is an enough incentive that we pass on to the franchisee partner also for this. See, we also don't promise them the entire tray. But what I'm saying is that there is there is a lot of interest now for them to take the entire tray, and they're willing to pay because they're seeing that they are getting repeat purchase when they have taken a single slot in the vending machine. It right? because the if you look at like FMCG products like food and beverage products and the D2C brand in this segment. Versus a D two C brand in apparel or maybe cosmetic sector, the very big difference, right, in the way their distributions are set up. Because in a, a lipstick which is distributed through a, a website or something, that's 
the cost is about 500 and hence when it gets delivered at about 40 50 rupees it does it is still less than 10 percent right of the product cost but for a chips or a bar energy bar of the same size which is also of 50 rupees or maybe 100 rupees if the delivery cost is again 40 rupees, how would the brand deliver that to the consumer in a more efficient way, right? Yeah. A brand would not be able to deliver a single packet. Helps a distribution like us, which basically works on a more of a hub and spoke model. You collate it at a master franchisee, then you work to a hub, which is a franchisee and the franchisee reselling to the different vending machine. This whole hub and spoke model is required and to make this efficient, right, cost efficient, you have created these smart stores, which do not require a person to stand, hence cut down the operational cost significantly. So a D2C element where you know where your product is placed, when the customer is buying, you are getting a real-time insight on the Alchini dashboard that so-and-so customer there has bought my energy bar. So that element of being near to the customer knowing who and when they're buying is also there, is also insured. And on the other side, you are able to deliver the product also instantly, which modern trade or a general trade outlet would have done otherwise. Amazing. Okay. You see this becoming 50% of your revenue from brands or will it remain like a... Yeah, it, at least 35, 40%. Amazing. Okay. What are the number of machines that, and maybe you can tell me from a timeline perspective, pre-COVID, what was the count? And then say 2020, what were the number of machines? So in 2018, we started with just two. So by the time year ended, we had about 50 odd. 2019, April 2019, we had about 50 odd vending machines. And March 2020, we had about 250 of them. And that's where COVID happened. And out of these 250, 200 were franchisee owned. Yeah, yeah, most of them were franchisee owned, right? And in 2019-20, we actually figured out this franchisee model. Pre-COVID itself, like we had started moving and like more than 80% of our vending machines by the time had gone on to the franchisee route. We had started on an asset light model by that time when COVID happened. And that actually came as, as a very good point to us unlike other players in the segment because when COVID hit, we were actually asset light almost. Anyways, coming on back to one timeline. COVID would have hit the sales because offices were shut down, co-working spaces were shut down. So there was like many pivots, like the first pivot happened when we moved from our own stores to franchisee stores. That was the second pivot happened actually after COVID, whereby we were, so pre-COVID, I would say more than 75% of our vending machines were there in corporate offices. And a very small percentage into college campuses, hospitals, and some of those kind of places. My, our first launch into when this COVID, etc. was happening, one of our franchisee partner asked us to move his machine to facility of Vivo. We was assembling plant in Greater Noida. So this franchisee partner was there in Greater Noida, had a vending machine in some corporate office. And he said, he insisted. We said that we understand your sales are not happening in this office. And till that time, everybody thought that next month, the lockdown would be over, right? Every month, every week would go by with that notion itself. We were trying to convince him that uh, don't move it, right? Just maybe wait for another month. But he insisted. He said, no, I want to move it to the Mihivo's manufacturing plant. I have a connect. I will move it there. So we said, okay, fine. Let's just move it. And that actually gave us the biggest insight so far of Dalcini, right? That manufacturing, we... Pre-COVID, we thought that manufacturing plants, people would not buy from vending machines because it's a smart store, you need a smartphone. You don't know whether people would have it or not have it. Because generally, plants have a cafeteria where you get like a yeah. 30, 40 rupees or you'll get like a full shoti dal chawal types. Yeah, so a lot of those preconceived notions and we, ha we did not have any manufacturing plant or a factory or an MSME where we would have a vending machine. And... That was the first one and that was a game changer for us because after the hit over there, we actually proposed the similar solution to Reliance. And in December of 2020, we proposed this to Reliance that you just put one demo vending machine of ours. And I still remember 25th December 2020, we actually installed our first vending machine in Reliance Jamnagar facility. And this was basis the feedback that we got from the September launch in Vivo's manufacturing facility. 
and that became an instant hit because people in Jamnagar had about like they were working 365 days so even when the lockdowns happened barring the first month yeah. maybe it's essential services it's essential services all in fact all of corporate offices everything was closed but and people had an option to work from home but factories were open fully functional they did not have anything which is called as work from home because people were coming and there were like three shifts in a day which was happening on the contrary all the food services were closed because they did not want any kind of food contamination etc to happen so they were asking people to bring food from home only so that they can avoid or basically cut the chances of any food based contamination and hence the vending machine launch at vivo and then at reliance became an instant hit and today as we speak more than 35% of our vending machines are in manufacturing plant the entire next year of covid which is year of 2021 went on to launching vending machines into manufacturing plants from vivo to reliance to aditya birla groups hindalco noreal and to whirlpool Hyundai, all of these manufacturing facilities where there was no lockdown, where people were totally working from office, from the factory, from the floor, right? Office floor. These were like pre-owned or franchisee-owned, like the Reliance one. And- we raised funds again in 2021, right? We deployed our own vending machines initially. We got them funded from an NBFC because it was an instant requirement over there. Yeah. What is the number of machines you have today now? We have 800 plus now, just reaching 900. So, okay. okay. And in how many cities? What's the spread geographically? We are there in 23 cities now, 11 states, about 35% into manufacturing plants, about 25-30% into corporate offices. Now we have a significant number into hospitals, college campuses, coaching institutes as well. We have a double digit number into co-working, co-living spaces also. Co-living spaces also is like co-living spaces, PGs. That is also a big chunk of our vending machine. Okay, okay, amazing. So what are the challenges you need to solve to make 800 as 8,000? What are those key things that you need to get so that 800 becomes 8,000? Is it supply? Is it capital? Is it marketing? So I would say that in terms of capital, that's not a challenge because we have set a model where we would have a hub and spoke model and we would have a franchise you would yeah you have a asset light model so you don't necessarily need capital yeah so today if i talk about not even two percent of our vending machines are on our books so that's not a challenge but the challenge obviously is basically when you go in tier two tier three cities that education of the customer yes that fresh food can be bought through the vending machine that notion has to be broken that once it is done right and obviously our model is to launch manufacturing plants then co-working co-living spaces in that city if it is there corporates in that city then hospital then colleges etc and then public market ma- uh, malls etc so in that you scale right so that has to be perfected. How do you educate customers that? How do you build that awareness? So one is basically through tech side, we do a lot of things like on, on the vending machine, we would show up different things about how fresh the food is, a lot of education that goes on when you are. There'll be like a video running or something like that. Yeah, that is the first bit of it. But I think as a brand, Dalshini, when we grow and people understand, start understanding that it's not about a vending machine. It's about uh, all kind of food being provided instantly to an unmanned store kind of a thing. So that is that once that piece sets into the customer's mind, it becomes easier to scale. And it's a very visible asset, which is marketing itself only because it would have some branding and TV screen and all of that. It's basically getting the foot in the door and the right door basically is what the first challenge is. Once you crack that, that you are able to. On the tech side, I would say that still in India, there are a lot of, I would say, challenges in terms of getting the right thing manufactured or right thing contract manufactured in India. So we are working on solving that challenge also that how do we have everything our idea is to have everything make in India eventually. So I think you just had your biggest fundraise recently, about $4 million. So what was that for? And prior to that, how much had you raised total before this series? 
We raised half a million in 2019. That was our first seed round that we did. Then we did another pre-series round of another half a million dollars. That was like one million we had raised prior. So this time we raised about four million. And uh, the idea is basically what I mentioned, the first challenge, which is basically marketing it right to the consumer in the right way, both technologically and obviously through the go-to-market strategy. Technology and marketing are the two pieces where we would be, I would say, spending this most of the sum. Help me understand how you market through technology. One way is obviously you need feet on street who are going out meeting corporates and trying to get foot in the door. What is the other way to market? So basically, if you look at it, that we are on our app itself today run a lot of campaigns, right? So basically a referring campaign, right? A corporate refers us to another corporate because once you say I'm there in Lucknow in a co-working space, how do I reach out to the people in that area who would want to then have Dalcini vending machine, right? Do you earn anything from sale of machine? That is purely passed on to the contract manufacturer. Yeah, that is, the agenda is not to make something on the sale of the machine. The idea is to... Yeah, yeah, you want that to, that number should grow. So that thing should stop that growth. Got it, got it. And what is the GMV that you do? Your total revenue from subscription, from sale of product, from... So we we are doing about 24 crore ARR is something that we are already at. Two crores a month is something that we are already doing of revenue. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. So currently you're, you're like a food vending machine brand. The name also Dalcini indicates that. Do you see opportunity beyond food? Yeah, in fact... When I say dal chini, it's actually essential. So everything which is essential is going to be sold through our smart stores. Today we are around food because that was the first problem we wanted to solve as a vertical. But beyond food, there is personal care products, there is hygiene products, cosmetics, bunch of stuff which can be sold through vending machine and which is already done if you go beyond if you go to china or japan etc people sell t-shirts from vending machines toys even newspapers are sold through vending machines at metro stations a lot of these impulse purchases in fact one of my dreams is to put up a vending machine at taj Mahal, selling those souvenirs taj Mahal souvenirs outside it it actually is meant for automating this retail why should india should waste our resources people resources especially for one guy standing outside the entire day selling souvenirs why can't he have five stores and just refill all five of them at different outlets of Taj Mahal rather than just standing at one one single gate so that's that that's the idea right like i feel that all the retailers in india they are those 40 odd sku's which they know and which is the reason that they would open up their store at 7 a.m. in the morning. Why do they have to do that? They already know that these are the 40 items which would get sold in the morning. Why do they just can't refill? Okay, so like people come for milk at 7 a.m. You can just have milk being sold through a vending machine. Correct. Why don't you just put those 40 items into the smart store and just have a good sleep today? That's my idea of retail in India like in next few years. And that brings us to the end of this conversation. I want to ask you for a favor now. Did you like listening to this show? I'd love to hear your feedback about it. Do you have your own startup ideas? I'd love to hear them. Do you have questions for any of the guests that you heard about in this show? I'd love to get your questions and pass them on to the guests. Write to me at ad at the podium dot in. That's ad at t h e p o d i u m dot in. 